So I'm Scott, I'm part of the CMS team within the centre. Um, today I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, doing analysis on uh, big data sets. Uh, so we're increasingly seeing larger and larger data sets as time goes on. Uh, things like CMIP6, like ERA5, where we're getting uh, petabytes of data coming in and wanting to do something with all of that giant data set. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about a few techniques on how to um, best do that. Um, the slides I'm using here are linked from the wiki. Uh, if you want to go and look at them later, uh, they're under the training page on our wiki. Let's see if I can get this started. Uh, so when we're talking about big data sets in terms of analysis, what we're really meaning is it's too big to load the whole thing to memory. Uh, so there are a few different uh, computer types at NCI uh, where we could be talking about here. On Rygen, you're looking at about 100 gigabytes per node. Uh, VDI, which is the virtual analysis desktops where you can run Jupyter notebooks and stuff, have about 32 gigabytes uh, per node. Uh, so anything over this, or any data set that's approximately equal or over this, you're going to run into trouble if you're just straight up loading your data, uh, either in MATLAB or Python or whatever, uh, because there's just not enough space to do anything with. So if we got a terabyte of uh, surface temperature data, we can't do anything with that on any of these nodes. What we have to do is split, split it up into different ways. Uh, so that we're not working on the whole thing all at the one time. Uh, so yeah, a few tips before we get started on working with big data sets. Uh, if you can, try and work on one block of data at a time. Um, so that could be a single month at a time, it could be uh, just a single spatial area, so just over Australia. If you're able to limit the amount of data you're, you're dealing with, obviously things are going to go much faster. So don't do a global analysis when you just need, say, over Sydney. Um, you can also test out with small subsets of the data. So if you're uh, setting up some big analysis, if you're doing the whole, the whole huge analysis, just straight up start off with no testing. What you can often find is you're just sitting there for ages, waiting for it to run, only for it to fail, and then you have to go and debug it and make changes and then rerun things. Um, so start off with a small, small data set. It's quicker to run. That means you get faster feedback and then can keep going as opposed to get, stopping getting distracted by something else. Um, it is fine to create intermediate files. So if you've got a few stages of processing, you can create uh, new files as you go along. Um, but try and make these smaller as you go along. So if you're creating a daily average, for example, that's smaller than, than hourly data. Um, so keep reducing the size of the data set that you're looking at. And also delete the files when you no longer need it. Uh, we want our science to be reproducible. So we want to be able to redo the data set, redo the analysis uh, when we come back to it later, which means we don't need to store all the intermediate artifacts. We don't need to uh, store our daily averages once we're no longer using them. We can go back to the original data source and run them again. And storage space at NCI is not infinite. Uh, we do have quite a lot of data there. Our disks are mostly full. So have a think before you're doing some big analysis on what the output size is going to be if you're actually going to be able to keep all of this data. You might just be able to run the analysis on a small subset but keep the code so you can then generate for other data sets, for other regions if you need to. 
Um, so I'm going to do an example today based around heat wave detection, um, which is something that comes up fairly often on our help desk, um, calculating or detecting where heat waves are happening. Um, so this is sort of an example of a, a multi-stage analysis where we can go through each of the steps and, and work out how to optimise them. Uh, so we've maintained a number of data sets at NCI, as Paolo was talking about last week. Uh, if you didn't see that, uh, there's a video up on our YouTube channel. Um, so these are provided so that we don't that our users don't have to go and re-download data sets and fill up all of our disks with duplicate copies of the same files. We've just got the one central location. Uh, so here I'm going to be working with the ERA-5 data set, which is a reanalysis product produced by ECMWF. Uh, we have global surface fields for pretty much the whole time period and 3D fields just over Australia, um, again for, I believe, the whole time period. Um, so the heat wave detection works by creating a threshold metric measure at each spatial grid point and each day of the year, and then going along our test data set and seeing if the maximum temperature is greater than this threshold. Um, so the threshold calculation is the 90th percentile at each day of the year. These are just rough numbers. These are changeable. Of a 15-day rolling mean of the daily maximum temperature. And for 30 years of hourly quarter degree era 5 data, that's about a terabyte of data we have to process to get this measure. Um, and hopefully some of these techniques will be usable for your own analysis. It's not going to be like a one-to-one -one correspondence, but some of the ideas should be usable. And as always, I'm not a climate scientist, so if I get things wrong, please bear with me uh, in terms of the science. Uh, these sort of just examples. Uh, so before getting started, Let's think about what we need for each of these steps. So we've got three steps to just get the threshold before we start looking at uh, finding where the heat waves actually are. We've got hourly data, so first we need to convert that to a daily maximum. Um, so when we think about what data we need for a daily maximum, we just need that day's data. So it's really local in time. And each grid cell is completely independent. We could parallelize this by space quite easily. Uh, then getting the 15-day rolling mean of that. So then we need 15 days around our, t our time value. So again, it's pretty local. It's less local than a, than a hourly, hourly uh, than a daily maximum because we're dealing with 15 days, 15 by 24 hours is a fair few uh, time steps, but it's still, it, we can just load one file and do that. And again, it's spatially independent, as indeed all of these steps are. So one of the, one of the easy ways to parallelize this would be uh, spatially. The 90th percentile is a bit more complex uh, because it's not as local in time. We have to get January 1st from each of the years in our, independent, in our input data set, so approximately every few 365 values. Uh, remember, there will be leap years because this is on a real calendar, so that does complicate things. Um, and it's spatially independent. So you can see that the first two operations are pretty close in what they need. They need around the time steps around the target time steps. So if we're uh, calculating it for January 1st, we need the, the, we need the hourly values for January 1st through uh, 7th and for seven days pre preceding that, and we can just get out this. 
And then maybe as a second stage, we might go here just because it's so different in what sort of data it needs. Um, in terms of size, this is reducing the total size by quite a lot. We're starting with hourly data. Converting that to daily data is 1 24th of the input size. Uh, converting that to uh, day of year values, uh, we're basically reducing it by the number of years. Uh, so we've got a, quite a large reduction in the total size, so it should be easy to do this, this calculation once and save our threshold values and then we can go back to them and not recalculate them every time. Uh, if this was going to turn out a terabyte of data, we might, on the other hand, uh, want to only run the, run the analysis for the data we're actually going to use. And then if we need a new data set, just rerun the whole thing, uh, rerun the analysis for that period. Um, so it is perfectly reasonable uh, to do this manually through loops and stuff. So we could, for instance, loop over each month in the year, each month. So start doing the analysis for January, grab all of the Jan grab all of the January data for each year, do the uh, daily maximum, do the rolling mean, bundle that all up together and uh, converting it, uh, getting the percentile value. A um, couple problems with this. You need to be a bit careful with our rolling values that you're loading the month plus the previous month plus the next month because we've got that 15 day window. If we're dealing with January 1st, we need some data from December. And if we're dealing with January 31st, we need some data from February. Uh, the second difficulty with this uh, is leap years. If you're dealing with, dealing with one month at a time, uh, the day of year is going to be a bit wonky. So you have to be careful in what you're doing. Um, so uh, March the 1st will be day uh, 60 or so, one year and day uh, 59 in other years. So just be careful of leap years. Yes, this is totally reasonable to do. If you're dealing with a, a smaller area, by all means, um, do it this way. I'm going to be talking about a bit of a different way, though. I'm going to be using Dask, which is a library for basically automatically doing all of these looping. It lets you break up a data set spatially or temporarily and automatically deal with all of these loopings. Um, so to get started, CMS maintains an Anaconda environment at NCI, um, which is basically a vast uh, li library of different Python tools for basically mainly themed around working with climate data. Um, so I'm going to be working with a few different Python libraries here. Um, X-Array is the main one. X-Array lets you work with NetCDF files really easily. It lets you select things by date or by latitude value rather than working out what index in the array corresponds to what latitude value. So selecting things really easy. Dask, on the other hand, sorry, I'm just going to mute. Okay. So Dask is this library for automatically breaking up an array into smaller fragments and then parallelizing that. Uh, bottleneck is a high performance uh, reduction algorithm, so things like uh, rolling means um, it, it um, is 
really good at. NumPy is just general matrix algorithms. Um, and also, if you're working with Dask, if you're working with chunked data, which we'll get into a bit later, it can be handy to do this um, input Dask diagnostics. What this will do is it will bring up a progress bar uh, whenever you're doing some sort of computation with Dask and show you how long you've got to wait until it's over. Uh, so that could be really handy, knowing if it's a really big operation that's taking way too long, or if it's just a quick one and you can leave it running in your notebook. Right, so like I said, we've got our data set with our hourly quarter degree data. Um, on the disk, that's about 400 gigabytes of data split into 467 files. Um, loading that with X-ray is really easy. We can use this uh, function MF open MF data set and just give it a path pattern. So you can put asterisks that normally this would be the year and this would be the uh, date that that file is valid for. This will automatically load all of these 467 files. It will concatenate them all together into one big time series. So here we've got a data set with 341,000 uh, times values and quarter degree resolution, so uh, 1440 by 721. So we've got this great big array uh, that we can then work with. Um, the data in here is stored as a Dask array, which is again um, broken up into chunks. And it's, it's Dask lazily evaluates arrays. So it only actually loads the data when it's needed. At the moment, it's all just pointing to the actual files on disk. Uh, we've not read in any of the data, we've just set up pointers so if we need January 1st, 1981, we read it from this file. Can I ask a quick question? Of course. So with the chunking that's happening there in that step, is, is Dask doing that automatically? Like if you didn't import Dask, that chunking doesn't happen, right? But you can get X-ray to do chunking as well. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, at the moment, this is purely X-ray. So we didn't need to import Dask for this. Um, MF, open MF data set will load one chunk for each file. So if we take a look at this, we've got uh, 1440 longitude values, 721 latitude values, and 737 will be um, however long that month was in hours, so for the first one. So each of these chunks here is just a single file starter. Uh, okay. We can manually change the sizes for those chunks later. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just to get started, it's just thinking about these in single files. Okay, but it's still called a Dask array, even though yeah, it's yeah, exactly. So it's doing this. X array is doing this with Dask for us. Okay. So, but if you didn't import Dask, does that still happen? Yep. As long as Dask is available. So if we've got Dask in our environment, it will work. So we've got this virtual data set made up of multiple files. Uh, just for Scott. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I'm just new to this. So what is chunking means here? Like you said, uh, like the XRA did the chunk size. So what exactly it means? Sure. Um, there's a good way to show this. Just find. Bring up the DAS, the DAS website is probably the easiest way to show this. DAS. If we 
we go to documentation. Sorry, I've just got windows in here that, from, from Zoom. Okay. So basically what chunking is, we've got a big array, so say this whole thing if we're looking at a two-dimensional array, and that's been broken up into smaller sub-arrays, uh, which is the smaller boxes here. Um, so all of these sub-arrays are not kept in memory. Uh, they're kept in, the, for instance, here, when we're dealing with files, uh, these are kept in the actual files themselves. So each of these individual dart, each of its individual NumPy arrays is kept in the file. Dask knows how to get them and how to get their data from them. And Dask combines a bunch of these pointers to the individual arrays um, into a single thing that we can work with without having to having to worry about how the how the sub data sets each of these individual squares where it's kept or how it's been created. Um, so each of these individual squares would be a chunk in DICE terminology. Yeah. So there, there's other cool features which we'll get to in a moment, but that's basically what we're talking about here. Each of these small squares is coming from a file and they've been combined into a, a big array. Okay. Thank you, Scott. All right. Um, let's bring this back up. Um, okay, so we've combined this into a virtual data set from the multiple files. Um, and if we go back to oops, Working again. There we go. If we go back here to look at our data set, you can see that the time values goes from 7 a.m. Uh, UTC on January 1st, 1979, uh, to uh, 2300 uh, February 28, 2019, um, just from this is what ECMWF publishes or has published so far. Starting at 7 a.m. is a bit inconvenient uh, for our daily maximums and stuff. It means we have to uh, deal with that somehow. The simplest way to deal with this for our purposes is just to cut it off. So we can select a time region from this big data set. Um, so here I'm going from uh, 0, 0,100 January 1st, 1980 to 2300 December 31st of 2009. So getting 30 years of data, just cleaning up those little bits at the end. Uh, so if we think about the actual size of this data set, it's about a terabyte. Um, you can get that by this n bytes thing. So if we're getting, um, I've not mentioned this before, but we've got the, the two meter maximum hourly temperature. So this is the value in our big array is the maximum temperature for that hour um, at each hour. Um, so because of this chunk in data sets just work with this data set, it's much larger than the memory we have on hand. So I did all of this on the VDI for the most part, which had, like we said at the start, 32 gigabytes of memory. Um, and that's let us keep this one terabyte of data loaded up and we can chop it and do basic operations on it um, easily without like blowing up all of the memory. Um, so yeah, Dask will only um, load the data it needs. If we just pop, if we just wanted to plot one time value of this data set, um, Dask would happily let us do it. It would be exactly the same as working with a 
100 megabyte file, we just select a one time step and plot it. And Dask go, deals with going to the actual file and reading the data that we need. Um, so then we can start a bit of analysis. Um, so this is all basic X ray stuff. Um, it's really good for doing this time series analysis or spatial analysis type stuff. So this is all built into X-Ray. We've got hourly maximum temperature, but we want the daily maximum temperature. Um, so we can use resample to do this. So we, we can do dot resample time equals D for daily, and then the maximum along the time axis for each day. And that works, that's pretty good. Um, it takes 20 seconds to do, which is pretty quick, but um, it's, it's not instant. When we're dealing with DASK data, generally we expect operations where we're not loading any data to return instantly. That's because it's not actually doing anything. It's storing how to do things. It's basically creating a graph, say, load this bit of data, load this bit of data, and add them together um, to get this region's data. Um, so 20 seconds is longer than instant. So, I mean, we could perfectly well do it, deal with this. Um, that would be fine, but we can make it a bit better. Uh, the reason it takes so long, by the way, is because of this chunk size. Um, so it's, it's changed from one chunk per month to one chunk per day. So it's further split up those uh, big blue array, big, big blue things from our, if I go back, it's further split up these blue arrays. So now it's split them up so there's a lot more along the time dimension. And that takes time for Dask to, to work out where things need to go. Um, so yeah, like I said, we've created a new chunk for each individual day and we've got 11,000 days to keep track of. So Dask is keeping lots more chunks around and has to work with. So that slows down our operations. Um, a different way to do that is to uh, just do a reshape of the array. So if we had We had a 1D array with time values. We then we could then get just the day, so we could break it up into individual days. It had each day being a new axis. So instead of one timeline, we've got oops, we've got a 2D array where we've got hour in the day along one axis and we've got day along the other axis. Um, so reshaping an array is, is much more efficient in general if you can do it. So just restructuring things. So here I've reshaped it to be 24 entries. I know we start at uh, 0, 100 hours because we did that trimming. So every 24 hours, this is a well-structured published data set. So it's just 24 hours, 24 hours, 24 hours, and just shuffling those, so those 24 hours along a new dimension, and then getting the mean along that new dimension gets up, up getting us the max this should be. Um, getting the maximum along that value will be the daily maximum, and we've reduced it to um, just a list of maximum values. So now rather than... Um, so in that previous one where you had a problem where the chunks are too small, there's not, mm -hmm. an, there's not an easy way just to change that attribute of the, of the X-Array data array. There's no like dot chunks and then just change the song. That, that's not... Uh, there is a, an option to do that, but basically that's keeping in the graph that Dask has. It's still got all of those chunk values. You can do a... Uh, dot chunk, chunk to change the chunk sizes. 
uh, but it's still going to have all of those daily things in the graph and the graph, and then there's going to be a chunk operation after that. Uh, it's just the way that Dask orders its operations. You're still going to have all of those values. So it's best to, to, to work around that in other ways if we can. Oh, yeah. Um, like I said, it's perfectly valid to do it the other way. Um, it's just going to be a little slower uh, when you're working. And if we can do it this way to get chunks. So now we've got 31 days in each chunk. Uh, that reduces the, the time taken by quite a lot. Um, okay. So we have lost the X-ray metadata at some point because so that's um, what I'm meaning there is if I clear all this stuff. Okay, here we go. So what I'm meaning by that is here we had all of our <coughs> axes. We had the time axis, so they had the longitude and latitude. So that lets us do those selecting. So like when we trim to the time axis or when you're selecting specific longitudes, we've lost all that because we just extracted the actual data, which is this task array thing. So we've just extracted this bit of the X-ray data set. Uh, when we did uh, two meter maximum dot data is extracting the actual task array, did the reshape. Um, X-ray arrays don't like to be reshaped. There's not a good. Well, there there are ways to do it, but um, it's better to extract the data array from it, do the reshape, and then add all of that metadata back in. Which you can do by just copying the, that from the original field. So this is how you create a new X-ray array. We put in that data we just calculated by reshaping the array, give it a name. Dimensions are the same as what we started with, so we can just copy that from the original array, as are the longitudes and latitudes. Uh, time is a bit different here because we've reduced from hourly data to daily data. We need new time values, um, which we can do just by doing that same uh, reshape operation and just getting the first value for each from each day, this is 0, 100 at each day, um, or you could get the 12 hour one, however you like to represent uh, a time mean. So I've got my daily time values as the time coordinate. Um, and here, so we've got 1980.01.01, 1980.01.02, and our dask array with our nice 30 day chunks, nice monthly chunks rather. Uh, the chunks won't all be 31 days. Uh, this will be actually the number of days in each month. It's just showing us the size of the first chunk here. So that's, that's given us um, our daily maximum. Um, doing the rolling mean can, is fairly similar. Um, so we've got an operation here, rolling, which is like we previously used resample to bunch up all of the, the day's time values into one thing. Now this is, rolling means we're getting the values 15 days around that along the time axis. So we've get, got the time axis, 15 samples here. So since we've got daily data, 15 samples is 15 days. If we had hourly data, this would be 15 hours either side, and we're centering the interval. Um, so that's seeing we're getting uh, seven days before this day, this day, and seven days after this day. And then we can do a mean on that. Um, so a lot of these operations that X-ray supports, they're sort of fairly similar to format. You're doing some sort of gathering operation. So here it's the rolling, or there was the resample, or you could group by, which we'll do in a, a bit. So a sampling and a group by, and then a reduce. So here we've 
groups by 15 days and then we're getting the mean along the time axis of that. Um, so that gets us our new uh, data array with the rolling 15 day mean. Unfortunately, there's a bug in X-ray at the moment and rolling, uh, there's a drawback because here we can see our chunk size is 11,000. So we've got our whole data set being held in a single chunk. Uh, so this is a bug, it should be fixed, hopefully in a couple of weeks, they are working on it. Um, but I'm just sort of bringing this up to show you some things that can happen. So keep an eye on chunk sizes if you're, if you're dealing with stuff like this. Uh, because if we tried to load this, um, we would run out of memory. We'd be loading in our whole terabyte of data into memory and that would break things for us. Um, so yeah, this is going to cause trouble when doing the analysis. Um, so the workaround is to go into Dask land and deal with this manually. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a bit about this, not because you're likely to see it, but because it's something you might see if you try to implement your own Dask functions. Um, so if you wanted to implement something like this rolling operation yourself. Um, so what we have here is a function called map overlap. What this is doing is basically a halo, it's generating halos around each of those uh, dask blocks. So if we go back to our so if we go back to our, our dask array, what this is doing is it's getting around each of our DAS chunks, it's grabbing some values from this one around the edge. So it's making them all a bit bigger. Uh, this is exactly the same as you'd see in Halo operations for a, for a climate model or something like that. I'm just gathering stuff around that. In this case, we're wanting to gather um, a Halo on the time axis, add things either side. So we're gathering 15 day, 15 time samples or 15 samples around each chunk. So that's going to be our halo. Um, oops, sorry. We're gathering 14 samples because we've got one in here along the time axis, uh, reflecting reflective boundary conditions, uh, remove the chunk when we're done. And then it's going to run a function we provide. So we're providing here uh, this bottleneck function, which is one of the libraries that I was talking about earlier. This is a moving mean. So what it's going to do is it's going to, oops, uh, work. There we go. So we've got our halo around the function, and then we're running running bottleneck dot moving mean along this, which is going to create our rolling average, chopping off the halos, and then combining everything back into a Dask array. Uh, so this is how, how you create your own Dask functions by using these map block functions. You have a function you want to apply to the whole array, but instead of applying it to the whole array, you apply it to each of the blocks, each of the chunks within the array. Um, so yeah, that gives us, instead of having the 11,000 uh, chunk size, now we've still got our, our monthly chunks. So again, this is only necessary if you're going to implement your own functions using Dask. Most NumPy functions are supported by Dask fine, um, so you don't need to worry at all for them. It's just if there's something special you've created yourself where you need to do this. Another thing to notice, uh, this isn't a centered mean, this is the day plus, 50, plus 14 days previous 
if we're just using this raw workaround function. Uh, so we would need to correct the time values for that. So it's, it's something to keep in mind that the assumptions might not be the same. Uh, we've gone to task mode, manually applied a function, so then we can convert back to an X-ray data array. Uh, and that should all work fine. And we've got our data array with our time axis, with our latitude and longitude axis, so we can select by specific regions. And it's a good thing to, do, to go and test every now and then. So we can uh, grab our data. So we can select a single day. Here it's the 28th of July, 1996. Um, X-ray includes a quick plotting function. So if you just do dot plot on a 2D data set, it's going to bring up a nice little plot for you. So we can check that our maximum temperatures are reasonable. Um, and so forth. So it's, it's good to do this every now and then. Just use this one time step, just to make sure it's not like all not numbers or something and everything's gone wrong. So Scott, when you, when you finally like do something and, and some data is you know, in that you're essentially computing, so the data becomes live as opposed to just lazy in the background. Mm -hmm. um, is it because you haven't done anything with DAS distributed yet and stuff? This is all just happening on one core on the. So, it will, uh, so DAS is like chunking everything and stuff, but it'll, it'll do all the chunking and stuff just on one core? Yeah, yeah, so, so this is all single threaded. So oh, by default, DAS will use multi-threaded, not multi-process, but it's something. Yes. Um, so, so we've just done this on the one um, process, basically. Um, so it's only loaded, we've only needed to load uh, one day. So it's only got, only done the analysis for this day. So it would have done the uh, 15 days either side of this. So it's loading July and August to get that data. So we just loaded two files um, to produce this plot, not the whole 400 or so files. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, for such a small example, we wouldn't really need more than one core, but I was just wondering whether it uses multiple cores automatically or whether you have to kind of tell it to. It, it does use, it uses multiple threads automatically. Uh, problem is that because of the way that CDF4 files work, it can't actually read them in parallel with threads. So all of the data loading is going to effectively be single threaded unless we go to distributed, uh, okay. which we will get to probably next week. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So this looks reasonable. Uh, 300 Kelvin is about what we'd expect. Um, Fairly cold in Antarctica. Again, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know. I'm not a climate scientist, so I'm not sure. Um, okay, so we've got all of this data. And now the next step is to get this 90th percentile. Uh, so like I was saying, to start with, this is going to be working a bit differently than the uh, sort of local in time operation we've done so far. So far we've just done the daily maximum, which just means that's that day's data and the 15 day rolling mean, which just needs a few days either side. Here we're going to have to, for a single day of the year, we're going to have to read from lots of different files. I've got about 30 years of data here, so it's going to read from 30 different files to do this. Um, so the simple way to do this is by grouping. So we can group by attributes of the time axis. So here I'm grouping by the time dot day of the year. Uh, you could 
group equally well with time.month, would group all of the Januarys together. Uh, this is, this is uh, grouping all day, day of year one and a day of year two. Uh, so stuff like year, day, month, day is probably not that useful in here because it would all group all of the first of the month from each month and each year together. So it's only going to be 1 to 31. And then I'm going to do a reduce operation, which lets us just run an arbitrary uh, function on each of those groups. So here I've grouped each day of each of the January 1sts, all of them together into one big, array, one big January 1st array. And then on that January 1st array, I want to run numpy.percentile along the time dimension and I'll percentile value is going to be 90. Um, unfortunately, reduce is not dice aware. Um, so it loads all of the data before it actually runs anything. And numpy.percentile isn't dice aware either. Uh, so we have to add dice support to the function uh, before we do anything. Scott, how do we figure out what functions are Dask aware and which ones aren't. Uh, so remember where I put that progress bar way back at the start when we were loading things? Mm -hmm. If you see that progress bar, it means something's, and you've not done like a plot or a save. If you, do, if you see that progress bar while you're just, just um, mapping out your analysis, that means something's not Dask aware because it's actually computing something. All of our Dask functions we want to return pretty much instantly like a second or two. If it's taking longer than that, what it means is it's actually going into the files and reading the data so it can um, do things, so it can do the calculations. Um, so yeah, how I know this is because I saw that progress bar when I tried to do a percentile um, calculation. Um, okay. Most of it works fine, uh, but if you do see that progress bar, um, if you've got a big data set, stop and think about if you can add DAS support to it or come to us and we can, we can help you with that. So you want to add DAS support to the existing function. Um, so that means going back to this map blocks, um, so applying a function to each, each chunk in the data set. Um, First, though, we need, do need to do a, a rechunk. So, the way percentile works is by sorting all of the values in the time dimension and then finding the value that's 90% along the, that list. So, we need to have all of the time values in a single chunk. So, at the moment, we've got one chunk for uh, 1990 is January 1st and one chunk for 1991's January 1st, and one chunk for 1992's January 1st. What we've got to do is merge all of those chunks together into a single thing, that then we can run that, we can run our numpy.percentile function on that whole time series at once. Um, so that's this rechunk function. This is like we were saying before, you can manipulate the sizes of chunks and it will automatically load all the data when it needs this value. And then, like we did before, we've got a mapping function. This is a simpler one because it doesn't have those halos uh, like we did for the rolling mean. This is just each chunk, now that we've merged all the time values together, it's going to run uh, numpy.percentile along an axis and a queue. Uh, we are removing the, the time axis when we do this, so we're going to have less axes after this. So we have to say drop axis. And often for Dask functions, you have to put this D type. Um, D type is a NumPy sort of convention it says whether you've got like an integer or a floating point number or a double precision. Um, 
Dask by itself doesn't know what you've got, so you've just got to say our oh, output output type is going to be the same as the input type. And then we can do a reduce on the Dask percentile with this allow lazy attribute or we'll, um, say reduce is going to work on a Dask array. Um, and then we've got our data set here. We've got day of year 366. Um, so this will depend on how you're wanting to deal with leap years. The way I've done this, um, January 29th is going on a leap year is going to be grouped up with March the 1st on not a leap year because it's counting day of year from the first day of the year. Um, so we'll have less less values on the last one. It's going to get, get every fourth value the last day of the year. Um, how that's going to work for your analysis is up to you. You can group things differently if you if you're wanting to keep just all of the January 29th separate. But yeah, so we've got our nice smaller array and we've got one chunk for each day of the year because of our our operation to reduce the sizes. Um, and what's next? And we're ready to try it out. So if we put in a plot, it goes along happily with our progress bar and the time, and then it comes up with an error. Um, so these you can see. In this case, it's a HDF error if you scroll down to the the bottom of this, which I can't do in the slideshow. Um, this is meaning that you've run out of memory if you see a HDF5 error. Um, so we've not done anything to the chunks. We've, we've loaded one file at a time. Um, so instead of doing that, we can change the chunk sizes to make things a bit more efficient. Um, and smaller chunks will use less memory. Another thing you can do if you're seeing errors like this is instead of running on VDI, run on one of the Ryzen compute nodes because the compute node is going to be dedicated to just you. VDI resources are shared, so if someone else is doing an analysis on another terabyte of data while you're doing your analysis on yours, uh, the memory is going to going to get conflict conflict. Um, so yeah, probably I think we'll end it there. But next time we're going to go into um, changing the chunking and actually setting this up as a, a PBS job we can submit to the queue uh, and actually run the full analysis. Um, so is there any questions on the stuff you've covered so far? Since we're about five minutes left. Okay. If not, uh, so next week we're going to continue from here. We're going to fix this error and we're going to make a a uh, job script that we can submit to the queue and will produce our output.